So we are in the Gospel of John. Chapter 3 of the Gospel of John, and I promise today we're going to finish chapter 3. All right, that's a milestone day. So we, we've been working our way through this, and this is John, the Gospel writer's account of the life of Jesus. Remember that John writes his account with this foundational premise, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so everything that he adds is evidence to support that premise. Jesus is the Son of God. As we worked through this, we saw that John included this conversation with Nicodemus. And, and in that conversation, that incredible revelation of truth that you must be born again. And then even greater than that, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And then we moved on, and John uh, continued his narration and continued to give us evidence. And, and one of those evidences was a conversation that took place between John the Baptist and his disciples. Remember, we talked about this last week, and just set that scene for us very quickly, that John is in the wilderness, and Jesus is nearby, and a Jew or maybe a, a delegation of the Jews came to John's disciples, and they were talking about purification. That sparked some questions in the minds of the disciples of John the Baptist. So they went to John the Baptist and said, what about this? And what about Jesus? And everybody is coming to him. And, and you testified about him. You were kind of a supporter of Jesus in the early days. But now everybody's going to Jesus and fewer people are coming to hear you preach. What about that? And so we saw John the Baptist's response to that. And you have it on your outline, just kind of the, the highlights of that. If we could paraphrase John's answers to his disciples. And the first thing he said was that, that what we have is from God. It's God who determines the shape and the scope of a man's ministry. And so if this is what God has given to me, this is what God has given to me. And we rejoice in that. And we looked at that detail and from that detail we're reminded that you know, the scope of our ministry may differ. Some may be much more noticeable. Some may have a more noticeable impact in their ministry. But the, the question is, are you being faithful with the ministry that God has given to you? In fact, you may not even think in those terms, you may not even think that you have a ministry. But the, the truth is that as you live your life in the world, as you live out Christ in the world, you have a ministry, you have an opportunity to impact someone. And I really appreciate what Pastor Marcus said this morning about moms. That you don't have to be the biological mom to have the impact of a mom. To have the impact of a godly woman shaping and caring and directing and nurturing are you being faithful with that ministry? Men, in the same way, are you being faithful with the ministry that God has given to you? And, and it's God who determines the scope and the shape of the ministry. It's just for us to be faithful to that. And then we, we went on with John the Baptist's response to his disciples. And we saw that next thing that John, once again, just emphasizes that it's not about me. It's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And we're reminded in that statement that our job, first, last, and always, is to point to Jesus. Not to build our own empire, not to build our own fame, not to build our own accolades. Our job, first, last, and always, is to point to Jesus. And then the last thing that we saw. John the Baptist pulls in that analogy, that picture of the bridegroom and his best man. And remember just very briefly that during that engagement period much of the conversation and communication was done through the best friend the best man but once the bridegroom comes the best man doesn't have to carry the message back and forth and that's really what John is saying now that Jesus has come now that Jesus is speaking for himself I don't have to carry that message for him and John says that's a reason for rejoicing so with that we now come to the other part of the statement. See, that was John the Baptist's conclusion about his own ministry. And now we have, in the last part of this chapter, the conclusions about Jesus' ministry. And, and we pick up on that theme and that idea that now that Jesus is speaking for himself, John doesn't have to be his spokesman. John doesn't have to carry the message for him. And by the way, Jesus is qualified and more than qualified to carry that message himself. And that's where we're picking this up today. So if you haven't done so already, open your Bibles to the Gospel of John in chapter 3, and we're picking up at verse 31. And here's how it reads 
in the New American Standard Bible. He says, he who comes from above is above all, and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. And no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not obey the Son will not see eternal life. But the wrath of God abides on him. Now, in that, we see that Jesus is qualified and more than qualified to speak of these things. Let's unfold that. Let's look at that. And, and back up, back to verse 31. We see that, first and foremost, that Jesus is qualified. Key in on this phrase, he who is from above. He is from above. What makes him qualified to speak of heavenly things? What makes him qualified to speak of eternal things? Well, John mentions it here. First of all, he is from above. There's a couple things that we want to point out as we look at that phrase in verse 31. And first is to realize this, that we're coming back, in a sense, to one of the themes that was part of our introduction. Remember when John, the gospel writer, introduced this, he, these great soaring words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Where was Jesus in the beginning? We're talking about Jesus. Where was he in the beginning? He was with God. And, and so, once again, we have this theme and this truth just brought back to us that Jesus is not merely a man who reached a, an elite status, elite level of spirituality. That he, in fact, from the very beginning and even before creation was with God. He is from above. And now we have that coming back here and, and we are reminded of that, that he is from above. And the one who is from above, the one who is from heaven, if you will, is the one who is qualified to speak of heavenly things. The one who existed before creation is the one who is qualified to speak of eternal things. And he's above and he's, he's qualified to do that. And then just to make sure we understand this contrast, we have the opposite view pointed out for us. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of earthly things. So in contrast to Jesus, we have those men of earth. And these men of earth, may, I'm pretty sure that he has in mind the prophets, maybe even John the Baptist himself speaking these words. Those who are from the earth really can only speak from an earthly perspective. You realize that? Those who are from the earth can only speak from an earthly perspective. And they may be eloquent. They may be profound speakers. They may be able to communicate some significant truth, but it's all from an earthly perspective. They can't speak from a heavenly perspective because they haven't been there yet. There have been a few cases in Scripture where we see an individual is given a glimpse of heaven, and then they get to go and try to explain what they've seen in heaven, and that doesn't always go well. But they have that earthly perspective. But the one who comes from above... The one who is from above, the word that was made flesh, the word that was with God and the word that was God, he has that perspective of eternal things and he can speak of eternal things. So listen to what, what John says right at the conclusion of that thought. That he who comes from above is above all and he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of, uh, speaks of the earth. He who comes from above is above all. And the next time that's mentioned, we would just bring in this understanding that, that he's not limited like we are. See, those who are from the earth and who speak of an earthly perspective speak of an earthly perspective because they're limited. Everything that we know has limits of time and space, and we can't imagine what eternity is like. We, we try to imagine that, and it stretches our mind, but we really don't have a full picture of that because we are limited in all things. But the one who is from above has no limits. So when he speaks of eternal things, he knows what he's talking about. He's not limited by time or by place. He's not limited by space. He's not limited by our earthly experience. That he is above all and he's qualified to speak. We see also that he speaks from first-hand experience. Look at verse 32 with me. 
what he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. So when Jesus speaks of eternal things, when he speaks of heavenly things, he's speaking of things that he knows firsthand. And again, we would go back and contrast that with the prophets, with a preacher. See, you understand that the prophets were really only repeaters of a message. That God would give them the message and then they would proclaim that message. That God would tell them what to say and they would repeat the message. But, but Jesus, who speaks of what he has seen and what he has heard, really we understand that he is the originator of that message. He's not simply repeating the message, but he is the originator of that message. And all that he says, all that he speaks, is true and accurate. Pick up on that. And just say, well, what does that mean to us? And why is that important to us? And, and we would just use this phrase. If you want to get the straight scoop about spiritual things, go to the one who knows. And we're not talking about a dynamic preacher. We're not talking about a prophet. We're talking about the one who is revealing the heart of God to us. You want the straight, straight scoop about spiritual things? Go to Christ. And you know, look at that and you think about that. You think incredible then seems incredible that men would would rather function on their own opinions rather than going to the true source that man would defer to his own opinion about what God should do and what God is like and what heaven might be like rather than coming back to the one who has revealed God for us that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and from that word made flesh, we have the true story, the, the correct and accurate revelation of who God is. He's qualified to speak for us and to us. Now, it's interesting here. We, we, we need to take a break. And kind of a, a parenthetical thought here. With this portion of the Gospel of John, there's this interesting transition that's not really quite clear to us. It's not entirely clear where John the Baptist comment ends and where John the gospel writer resumes his narrative. And this is one of those cases where we're not sure if the next words are John the Baptist words or John the gospel writer's words. It, it, it's kind of interesting too that in this passage we see those introductory themes coming back to us. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and nobody paid attention to him. And we're going to unfold that in a minute. But doesn't that sound familiar to what we saw in that introduction? He came to his own, and his own received him not. And Bible scholars looking at this have understood this in a couple ways. That maybe at this point, at the end of verse 32, that John, the gospel writer, is now picking up the narrative. And it's no longer John the Baptist testifying, but now John, the gospel writer, is adding his narrative. And he's coming back and emphasizing the theme that he touched on in his introduction. The opposing thought is we still have John the Baptist speaking and these words made such an impact when they were reported to John the Gospel writer that he folded them into his introduction. So all that's to say we're not sure who's really speaking here, if it's John the Baptist or John the Gospel writer. But either way, we're safe in saying this is John's testimony about the ministry of Jesus. So your outline is still correct. But, you know, here's what we need to know. There's a transition here and a theme that is being followed here. Either John the Baptist or John the Gospel writer makes this comment that no one receives his testimony. Right at the end of verse 32. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies. No one receives his testimony. And that sounds a lot like that introductory comment. He came to his own, and his own received him not. What does he mean by that? And, and certainly we see in Scripture that there were some who paid attention to that and some who came to him and some who embraced it and believed that. Maybe he's just speaking in, in generalities or maybe he's, he's, he's talking about the Jews. We're not really quite sure why he would use that hyperbole to say no one paid attention to him. But it really does set up this interesting contrast that makes us wonder why nobody pays attention to that. Because here is the one who is above all things. Here is the eternal, self-existing God who has made human flesh for us, who proclaimed the heart of God the Father, and nobody seemed to pay attention to that. Nobody paid attention to that. Why wouldn't we 
pay attention to that. And maybe the answer is because that's what sin does. The sin blinds our eyes and stops our ears and hardens our heart so that when the truth is presented, we don't recognize it. Maybe it's a case that we have lived in the darkness for so long that when the light is presented, we don't recognize it. And in fact, it seems harsh to us. No one receives his testimony. But then we have the next comment in verse 33. And he who received his testimony has set his seal to this. And we'll talk about what that means. But now we've got the contrast. And so obviously somebody has received his testimony. We're not sure at this point if, if John the Baptist is still speaking or maybe it's John the Gospel writer is speaking. And we're also not sure of who the he includes here. Maybe he's speaking of, of himself. Maybe John the Gospel writer is picking up the narrative and say, but the one who did receive it, sets his seal to this. I will confirm and I will testify that this is true. And maybe he's just talking about people in general, that those who grab a hold of this, those who receive this testimony and grab a hold and say, I believe it's true, they set their seal to that. Now, what does that mean? That's the, really the important part of that phrase. The one who receives it sets his seal to this, that God is true. And what we have to do is just picture in that culture, in that time, the, the signing and um, well, it, the signing of a document. It's the ratification of a treaty or an agreement or a deed. And it was specifically true if you were more wealthy, if you were ratifying that agreement, you would have your own personal seal and you would stamp that dark document with your seal. And that would be an indication that you are in full agreement with this and you plan, plan to and intend to comply with the agreement. It's like fixing your name to that. They sign their name to it. And just the way that I understand it, uh, not so much in a seal, but if you were to sign a document or to sign a petition, don't take that lightly. What you're saying is that I agree with this 100% and I plan to abide by that. And, and the best picture that I can give to that would be those men who signed the Declaration of Independence. That that statement was made, and then one by one they came and signed that, and by signing it they're saying, we say that that's true. And we're going to live or die by that statement. And we want the world to know that. So in, in that sense, that's, it. that's exactly what is being said here in John chapter 3, that those who receive that testimony of Christ stamp their name on that, they seal that, they sign that document to say, I believe that God is true. I believe that God is correct and accurate when he reveals his heart. I believe that God is correct and accurate when he talks about himself and that revelation of God being a holy, righteous God. I believe that's true. Not just in theory, but I'm going to live and die by that. That God is a holy God. And, and then we carry that out and say, when God reveals the nature of sin and the presence of sin and the consequences of sin, I believe that's true and I believe it so, so much that I'm going to fix my name to that document and I'm going to live and die by that. Not just in theory. I believe it's true. But I also believe the, better, the best part of that revelation and that God has provided a way to be redeemed. And that redemption is in Jesus and in Jesus alone. That God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. I believe that God is true, and I'm fixing my name to that. And I tend to live by that and abide by that and live and die by that. And so those who have received that, with their stamp, their seal on that. Now, at that point, it's kind of a parenthetical thought because the next verses really talk about, um, again, the qualifications of Jesus. He's qualified to speak of eternal things, but not just qualified, he's authorized. He's authorized to speak of eternal things. So we continue on with that narrative. And again, we're not sure if this is John the Baptist or John the Gospel writer speaking. Regardless, it's true. Verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. What truth is being revealed there? What's unfolded for us? Just this wonderful, incredible truth. That the Son of God was sent by God to speak the word of God. The Son of God sent to speak the word of God. 
God sent his son into the world just to speak forth his word and to make that revelation. And again, when we say that, that God sent forth his son, what does that say about the nature of Jesus? Did you back that up? God sent him, where was he? He was in the beginning with God. And so now we come back to that truth that we started the gospel with. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then a little later, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, that the self-existing eternal God took on human flesh for us. And God sent forth his son for that purpose. Sent forth his son so that he might proclaim the word of God for us. There's, there's a, a richness and a truth to these statements. That he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Speaking the words of God. Now what does that mean? What does that mean? He speaks the words of God. It, it, it's not just that he speaks about God. But he speaks the very words of God. And, and one thing that we need to understand here is that Jesus was perfectly in sync with God the Father in all that he said and all that he does. He was perfectly in sync with God the Father and at no time did Jesus go off and proclaim his own message. Everything he said and everything he did was in sync. In fact, it was given from the Father. I should have put these references up on the, on the projection for you, but write these down. Just John chapter 6, we see that again. We're going to come back to that in chapter 6. That Jesus said, and he says this over and over again, I came to do the will of him who sent me. I'm not here to accomplish my own program. It's not up to me. I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. Again, in John chapter 8. I speak the things which I have heard from him, Jesus says. The things that I speak, the things that I tell you, the things that I'm speaking in the world, these are the very things that I heard from my Father, perfectly in sync with the heart and the will of the Father. Again, we see it in John chapter 12. Jesus said he hasn't spoken of himself, but the Father who had sent him. So he came to speak the heart of God. And what God gave to him, he spoke forth. But then we also understand that whatever he said was the word of God. And anything that Jesus would say was the word of God. Why is that? Because he was God. He was this eternal, self-existing God who took on human flesh. So anything that Jesus said was the word of God. But the good news is it was always in sync and in harmony and consistent with what God the Father would also say. He was authorized. He was sent from the Father. But we also see that he was sent with power. And that there is a power behind that in full agreement with the Father. Look at the end of verse 34. For whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. That phrase, I think we are contrasting again those who would speak of the earth, who are from the earth and speak from our human perspective and specifically those Old Testament prophets when we read about those prophets and those men and women of the Old Testament we realize that God would give his spirit for a season and for a season that spirit would rest on them and empower them but it was possible that they would lose the presence of the Holy Spirit but what does it say about the one that God has sent he has the spirit without measure not just a not just a, a gifting of the spirit not just a measure of the spirit but without measure which, you know, we could tie back in that's just that incredible truth of our triune God. That he is God. He is the Spirit of God. He is the Son of God. And they are all one. But even more than that, just even while he was ministering on earth, that the power of God was with him fully and completely. So that all that he did and all that he said was, in that sense, authorized and empowered by God through the Spirit of God. And we've got that incredible truth then. That the Son of God spoke the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the glory of God. The Son of God speaking the Word of God by the Spirit of God to the glory of God. And that's really what John is pointing to here. Is he qualified to speak for us? Is he qualified to speak of eternal and heavenly things? Absolutely. And if he's qualified, then we must, we must pay attention to him. There's one more thing that we see in this passage. 
And that's the truth that God has given all things into his hands. Look at verse 35 with me. The Father loves the Son, and it's given all things into his hands. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. But the wrath of God abides in him. That statement in verse 35, the Father loves the Son, and it's given all things into his hands. Again, it speaks of authorizing and empowering. But the first phrase is important, that the Father loves the Son. And it's more than just an emotional bond that's being spoken of here. Really, I think what this is revealing for us is that that relationship between God the Father and God the Son has no barriers. We could take it to mean that everything that Jesus did was pleasing to the Father. There were no barriers. That no time in his ministry on earth did Jesus veer from the purpose and the plan of God. That everything was pleasing to the heart of the Father and there were no barriers in that relationship. Now that truth becomes very poignant a little later in the story. When that perfect relationship that had no barriers suddenly experiences barriers as our sin is placed upon him. It makes that, that part of the scene so much richer and deeper for us. But there is that relationship between father and son, and God has given all things into the hand of the son. In essence, what we have here is the father saying that whatever he says, I say. There's no difference between us. There's no barriers between us. And we could take that on a human level of a king or a, a president of a corporation who gives authorization to his son to say, from now on, when my son speaks, it's as if it's coming from me. When my son acts, it's with full authority to act in my name. And so whatever he says, whatever he does, you consider it me saying and me doing. God has given all things into his hands. Is he qualified to speak? Absolutely. Is he authorized to speak? Absolutely. So what should we do in response to that? If he's authorized to speak and he's qualified to speak, what do we do in response? Well, we should pay attention, right? And the, the last little part of this chapter really speaks of our response to the ministry of Christ. And in our response to the ministry of Christ, there are three key words, three action words. And the first one we see earlier, verse, verse 32, right at the end, that no one receives his testimony. And then verse 33, but he who received his testimony has set his seal to this. What's the instruction for us? Receive it. We receive that testimony. But what does that mean? To receive it, it it's much more than just giving, giving a... a a mental assent to it. It's much more than agreeing with the theory. There are a lot of people who agree with the theory of Christianity and who could tell you the details and the facts of Christianity and even say that it's true, but that's not the same as receiving it. To receive it really has the picture of grabbing a hold of it and taking it to yourself. That phrase, own it. You need to own it. Not just be familiar with it, but own it. You take it to yourself. You grab a hold of it, and you don't let go of it. Because that's your hope. That's your confidence. That's your future. That is eternity. You own that. There are people who listened to Jesus and enjoyed listening to Jesus and were encouraged by the things that he would say, but they never grabbed a hold of it, and they never owned it. Here's the difference. And it's the last two words that we see right here at the end of the chapter. It's interesting how these words work together. It's the word believe and the word obey. Verse 36, but he who believes the Son has eternal life. Okay, again, it's more than just an intellectual agreement. It's believing that it's true. It's taking God at his word and then acting upon it. And, and notice the difference here. This, I, I just think this is interesting. That in the middle of that verse, in the middle of that statement, there's a contrasting word. It contrasts two different conditions. And the first is, um, but he who believes in the Son has eternal life. Now the contrast. But here's the opposite condition. And the opposite condition is the one who does not obey. Did you pick that up? First condition, believing. 
Second condition, not obeying, and they are opposites. And so if, if we work with that and understand that, what he's saying is to fail to obey is the same thing as fail to believe. Or you turn that around. Fail to believe is disobedience. The opposite of believing is disobeying. And so the same thing as believing is obey. If you believe, it results in action. What, what's the phrase we use over and over again? If you believe something, it will always result in actions, and your actions will reveal what you really believe. And so if we're going to grab a hold of this and we're going to live this, we have to believe that it's true, and not just in an intellectual manner. We have to let it direct our lives, and our lives are changed because of it. And that brings us to the phrase that's part of our, our mission statement and our statement that's true of our church, that we are here to live out what we believe, that it's not just an intellectual exercise and it's not just a spiritual requirement that we check out. We let it change the way we live day by day and week by week. We live it out, and if we fail to live it out, then maybe we didn't even really believe it in the first place. Is he worth listening to? Is he qualified to listen to? Absolutely he is. So we're going to pay attention to that. I want to have our praise team come back to the platform. I threw them a curve this morning because we didn't do the last song that we had practiced to do. I want to do that now. The last song is a hymn that you might be familiar with. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. Our world crowds in. Our world would distract us with worries and cares and promises of fulfillment and, and fullness. But none of that lasts. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. So, I, yeah.